1964. Japan's bullet train shatters speed records, leaving the world awestruck and Britain embarrassed on its own rails. The official story says Japan won because it built straighter tracks, but that overlooks the real crisis. Britain's tracks, tangled since Victorian times, made high-speed travel impossible unless someone reinvented physics. This is the forgotten rivalry behind the advanced passenger train, the project that dared to challenge Japan. What really happened when a nation tried to outpace the future but was trapped by its own past? In October 1964, the world's attention snapped to Japan. The Tokaido Shinkansen, a silver and blue streak, began slicing across the countryside between Tokyo and Osaka at 210 kilometers per hour. It was more than a new train. It was a new definition of what was possible, the future announced on rails. The tracks ran straight as a ruler, built fresh for speed, unfurling through farmland and city without a single Victorian detour. For the Tokyo Olympics, the bullet train was more than a transport system. It was a national statement, the future wearing a Japanese badge. The numbers spoke for themselves. A journey that once took nearly seven hours now finished in under four hours. The Shinkansen's Zero series, with its streamlined nose and electric hum, set the global standard for high-speed rail. Crowds lined platforms, watching as the train blurred past, barely disturbing the air. International press called it the Dream Super Express. Engineers from Europe and the United States arrived with notebooks, trying to decode how Japan had leaped so far ahead. Meanwhile, across the North Sea, Britain's pride was bruised. This was the country that invented the railway, but its main lines now looked like museum pieces. The West Coast Main Line, Britain's backbone between London and Glasgow, twisted through towns and hills, laid out in an era when steam engines ruled and land was cheap. Straightening these tracks would mean bulldozing cities. It was a fantasy in the age of austerity. The Shinkansen's success was not just about speed, it was about the freedom to erase the past and lay down perfection in steel. For British Rail, the message was brutal. If you wanted to run at 200 km per hour or more, you needed a straight line unless you could find a way to cheat the laws of motion. The Shinkansen had set the bar, and the rest of the world was left staring at the scoreboard, wondering how to catch up without tearing up their own history. The race for the next leap in rail technology was not just about who could go fastest. It was about who could solve the problem no one else wanted to touch. How do you outrun the past when the past is built into every mile of your track? Britain's railway map wasn't drawn for speed. The West Coast Main Line, the country's busiest trunk from London to Glasgow, was carved out in the 19th century, when steam engines ruled and landowners insisted that tracks snake around their estates rather than cut through them. Every mile is a negotiation with hills, rivers, and the stubborn grid of Victorian towns. By the time the line was finished in the 1850s, it was a marvel of the age, just not the straight, flat kind that would ever welcome a bullet train. On paper, speed and curves are natural enemies. The physics are simple. When a train rounds a bend, centrifugal force tries to fling everything sideways. The tighter the curve or the faster the train, the stronger the invisible hand pushing you toward the window. That force grows with the square of the speed. Double the speed and you quadruple the sideways shove. At 100 miles per hour, a gentle curve can feel comfortable. Push to 125 miles per hour and cups rattle. At 150 miles per hour, the same curve turns into a test of stomachs and steel. Speed matters. This is the Victorian curve, the ghost in Britain's rails. The old route with its endless bends forced every express to slow down, no matter how powerful the engine. The Shinkansen did not have this problem. Japan built its high-speed network on fresh ground with sweeping gentle arcs and long straightaways that let trains run flat out. Britain, boxed in by history and budget, could not bulldoze cities or buy up half the Midlands just to lay new track. The cost was not just financial, it was political dynamite. So British Rail faced an impossible choice. 
Either accept a future of slow trains, or find some way to make the old curves disappear, at least as far as passengers were concerned. Engineers at Derby were handed a brief. Make a train that could run 30 or 40% faster around the same bends, without tossing people out of their seats or tearing up the track. The challenge was not just about going fast, it was about outsmarting the geometry of the past. The answer would demand something no one else had tried on this scale, a machine that could cheat the Victorian curve without laying a single new rail. At a squat brick building in Derby, a handful of British engineers stared down a problem that had stumped the world. How to make a train fly through curves without making passengers feel like they had been tossed in a washing machine. The answer, they insisted, was tilt, but not the lazy sway of a hammock. This would be active tilt, powered by sensors and hydraulic muscle. The concept was simple in theory, wild in practice. Imagine a motorcycle taking a bend, the rider leans in, countering the sideways shove of the turn. The advanced passenger train would do the same, but for hundreds of people at once. Hidden accelerometers read every twist in the track, sending signals to hydraulic rams tucked beneath the floor. In a heartbeat, the entire car body would swing up to 9 degrees into the curve, just enough to keep the tea in your cup instead of your lap. 9 degrees. This was not a gentle nudge. 40 tons of steel, glass, and passengers would bank like a jet, slicing through bends at speeds no British train had dared before. On the test track, the prototype known as APTE broke records. 152 miles per hour, faster than anything that had ever run on those old Victorian rails. The ride felt uncanny, cups stayed upright, luggage did not slide. For a brief moment, gravity and geometry seemed to shake hands. Engineers at Derby watched their creation with pride. The tilt system was not just a trick, it was a working answer to the impossible curves of Britain's past. The numbers proved it a 30% speed boost through the worst bends, all while keeping passengers planted in their seats. The World's first active tilt train was not a drawing board fantasy. It was real, roaring down the track, and for a moment, it felt like Derby had bent the laws of physics to their will. 30% On a humid August morning in 1975, the APTE prototype lined up on the old Dalby test track, looking more like a space-age spaceship than a train. Under the skin, it was packed with technology no one else had dared to try. Gas turbines roared at its core, but the real magic was in the numbers, 152.3 miles per hour, a British speed record that still turns heads. This was not on a narrow straight test line either. The rails beneath were the same Victorian curves that had kept every express crawling for a century. For the first time, a train had outrun the very map it was built on. Speed was only half the problem. Stopping a train at 150 miles an hour on Britain. This crowded signal choked main lines needed a solution straight out of science fiction. Conventional brakes would have melted or else needed so much distance you would overshoot the station by a mile. The engineers at Derby came up with something nobody expected, the hydrokinetic brake. Instead of grinding to a halt with friction and red-hot steel, the APTE used water turbines. At high speeds, the train's kinetic energy was channeled into spinning discs, churning water into a controlled roar and bleeding off speed without burning up the hardware. The system could haul the train down from full tilt within the same block sections the old expresses used, all while keeping the brakes cool enough to touch. The test runs proved the physics worked. The APTE did not just go fast, it stopped fast too, and it did it safely. Every gauge, every telemetry printout told the same story. Darby's ideas were not just clever, they were real. For a moment, it looked like Britain had cracked the code, bending curves, breaking records, and reinventing how to stop a runaway future. The next challenge would be keeping that control when the train switched from gas to electric and when the pantograph met 25,000 volts and a whole new set of headaches. Switching from gas turbines to electric power did not just mean swapping engines, it meant inviting a whole new set of headaches onto the roof. 
The West Coast Main Line was now electrified at 25,000 volts, so the APT needed a pantograph, a spring-loaded arm reaching up to brush the overhead wire and draw power at speeds the old system had never seen. On a normal train, the pantograph sits on a steady roof, tracking a wire that zigzags a few centimeters side to side. But on the APT, the roof could tilt nine degrees in either direction, swinging the pantograph head out of line with the wire just as the train hurled itself through a curve. Engineers at Derby built test rigs to watch what happened next. At 125 miles per hour, the pantograph sometimes pressed too hard, yanking the wire upwards by several centimeters at the masts. Other times it lost contact and the current had to leap a gap in a shower of blue sparks. The track's Victorian geometry, with its unpredictable curves and dips, only made things worse. Every time the body leaned, the collector had to stay perfectly under the wire or risk arcing, pitting, and emergency shutdowns. The solution was to anchor the pantograph not to the tilting roof, but to a rigid frame referenced to the bogey, letting the body tilt around it. Even so, the system needed constant tuning, adjusting springs, damping, and even the shape of the collector head to keep the contact force in the narrow band between too weak and wire ripping strong. All this was happening at the same time as Darby's team tried to integrate CAPT, a cab signaling system built around an Intel 4004 microprocessor. The driver now had speed limits delivered straight to the cab, triggered by trackside transponders. It was one more layer of technology that had to work flawlessly at 125 miles per hour through rain, snow, and the industrial grit of Britain's busiest railway. Every subsystem, including tilt, brakes, power collection, and signaling was being pushed to its limits. And in the background, management was already whispering about public launch dates. The pressure to deliver was mounting, and the margin for error was shrinking with every new line of code and every extra kilogram on the roof. By the late 1970s, the APT project found itself in a tightening vice. Britain's economic crisis had turned every government department into a battlefield and British Rail was no exception. Treasury memos landed on managers' desks with the same message, do more with less, or not at all. The gas turbine dream was the first casualty. Oil prices had soared, and Parliament wanted electrification. So the engineers swapped out turbines for 25,000 volt overhead wires, adding a heavy pantograph to a train that was supposed to dance through curves. Every new component brought its own set of headaches. Budgets shrank while expectations ballooned. The original plan called for a careful rollout, experimental sets, then prototypes, then a full production fleet. Instead, management eyed the prototype APTP and declared it ready for prime time. The engineers at Derby protested. The tilt system still needed tuning. The hydrokinetic brakes worked on the test track, but the real world was messier. The new electric hardware had barely survived a winter but patience was in short supply. The political climate demanded a public win. Newspapers were running out of patience, and so were the ministers who signed the checks. Strikes rolled through the railways, slowing progress and draining morale. Every time a union walked out, another deadline slipped and another feature got trimmed. The pressure ratcheted up, get the train into service, prove the investment was not wasted and do it before the next round of cuts. In meeting rooms, managers circled launch dates on calendars while engineers counted the unfinished lines of code and the untested circuits. The APTP, a machine built for the future, was being hustled onto tracks that still bore the scars of the 19th century. The difference between a prototype and a finished product blurred under fluorescent lights and mounting anxiety. The spring was wound tight. All it would take was one bad morning for everything to snap. At seven in the morning, the first glass of champagne was poured. British Rail wanted to impress the press, so they turned the APT launch into a rolling breakfast party. Journalists, politicians, and a handful of engineers squeezed into the new tilting carriages, plates piled with eggs and toast, flutes of fizz in hand. Outside, the temperature hovered below freezing. Inside, the mood was somewhere between hopeful and hungover. Champagne. The train slipped out of Glasgow Central, gathering speed as it barreled south. For the first hour, everything went according to plan. 
But as the APT hit the first serious curves north of Carlisle, the trouble began. The hydraulic tilt system designed to swing the carbody up to 9 degrees was fighting a losing battle with the cold. Thickened hydraulic fluid made the actuators sluggish. Some cars tilted late, others not at all. Passengers watched the horizon lurch sideways while their inner ears felt nothing. The result was instant disorientation, eyes and stomachs waging war. Tilt By the time the train reached Preston, the party atmosphere had curdled. Sick bags came out. Journalists who had started the morning with bravado now clung to their seats, faces pale. The mismatch between what the eyes saw and what the body felt, made worse by the effects of early morning champagne, sent waves of nausea down the train. In some coaches, the tilt stuck upright, leaving everyone to slide helplessly into the curves. In others, the system snapped on late, throwing passengers sideways without warning. Nausea Word spread quickly through the carriages. Reporters scribbled notes between bouts of queasiness. By the time the APT pulled into London, Euston, the nickname was already circulating, The Vomit Comet. The next morning, headlines screamed about Britain as Supertrain turning its passengers green. The technical triumph was lost in a flood of sick jokes and horror stories. Within days, British Rail quietly pulled the APT from service, hoping the public would forget what the press never would. Vomit Comet Decades later, tilting trains quietly glide over Britain's ancient curves, powered by technology once discarded as a national embarrassment. The world races ahead not by clinging to pride, but by learning from failure. Innovation can vanish overnight, only to return with a new passport and a higher price tag. The lesson? The next breakthrough might already be rusting in a siding. Share your take in the comments below.